Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, our World PI Week uh, kickoff webinar. I'm really excited to um, begin this webinar and start our week off for World PI Week, um, talking about the World PI Week theme this year, which is ensuring access to treatment. So I'd like to start today uh, with a little land acknowledgement. Today, uh, SIPO is uh, we work, and I find myself today on the traditional and unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking people that's here in Victoria. And we are also have historical relationships with the Songhees, the Squimalt uh, people. And uh, I don't know where you find yourself today, but if we could just take a second to recognize where you are, um, that would be wonderful. So today uh, we're using Zoom. So if you have a question for our panelists, you can use the chat function. You can use the Q&A or, or you can raise your hand. We will have, uh, our presenters will each be speaking and then we will have a Q&A session at the end. So there will be time for questions. Uh, we will be monitoring the questions as well. So um, you can, we, we can save your questions. So make sure you can ask your questions. You don't have to keep them to the end. And then at the end, we will be answering all questions. If you have any technical difficulties, if you can't hear, um, if you can't see the slides, um, Lauren's here with us today, uh, so you can direct message the CIPO office and uh, we'll help you out. So our guest today, I'm super excited to have with us um, Martine Perjean and Adrian Goretsky. Uh, Martine is the current president of our International uh, Patient Organization for PI, IPOPI. Uh, she was elected in 2018 as president after serving eight years as vice president on the board. In, two, in 1998, Martine co-founded IRIS, which is the French patient organization for primary immune deficiency. And after 10 years with IRIS, she was named an honorary member for her contribution there. She is still an active board member with IRIS today and supports IRIS and their executive in that, in that way. Um, Martine believes uh, with her advocacy work that patients should not only be heard, but also listened to uh, when it comes to their decisions and decisions being made about their health and treatment, which we also agree with, and that's what we're working for as well. So thank you for joining us, Martine, today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And Adrian Goretsky uh, is the former leader of the Polish Patient Organization for uh, Primary Immune Deficiency, Immunoprotect. Uh, he was also uh, on the uh, IPOPI board as well. Um, and for his successful contribution, Adrian was given the Luciano Vestali Award in 2014. He is also the recipient of the University of Silesia's Rector's Award in 2020. And last year, uh, he was shortlisted for the Eurordis um, Award uh, for Patient Advocacy, which is really amazing. So we're happy to have him here. He, uh, in 2017, um, founded the Healthcare Education Institute, which is who he's representing here today. Uh, Adrian is a patient himself and uh, brings a unique voice to the uh, conversation today. So thank you, Adrian, for joining us. Thank you for this introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna let our, hand it over to our wonderful panelists. Uh, so I'm gonna start with Martine. Thank you, Whitney. And I am sharing my screen. I guess you can see it. Okay. So the subject is about ensuring access to treatment. And there, um, I, I'd like first to have some introduction about IPOPI in the case you wouldn't know us. IPOPI is the Association of National Patient Organization dedicated to improving awareness, access to early diagnosis and access to care. And this is for patients living with a primary immunodeficiency worldwide. <clears throat> in that perspective, you can see this nice group and someone here that you may know. Um, at a glance, I just would like to highlight the fact that uh, we have a very committed diverse board coming from all the continents, a committed and diverse medical advisory panel, a committed and growing staff, a growing membership and a united community. And I think this is a very a big strength of our community to be united and to promote um, cooperation. 
Um, as per the membership, we, act, uh, we currently have 69 countries, last being Israel. And you can see that we pretty well cover the world, despite the fact that Africa is still, uh, in Africa, we still have a lot of uh, country missing, but we are working hard on that. So to make people aware on the fact that, of the fact that this is very important to uh, be in the patient group uh, as per access, because this is the, the theme of this, uh, this meeting. Today is the day where we launch the World PI Week. A World PI Week is a momentum for our community. What uh, part do we take as IPOPI? We are one of the members of this consortium. And you can see that this consortium is made of a lot of uh, organization covering all the continents, uh, um, Asia Pacific, Africa, uh, Arabic countries, uh, this is CIS, you, you well know, European, uh, European again. Here, this is the only uh, national body, I think it's part of history. Um, the nurses, of course, the, the patient uh, groups, uh, the Jeffrey Model Foundation, the Latin American group, the, the industry here, and CPID for uh, Southeast Asia. So we are a, a large consortium and all together we work to, uh, in order to define a, a yearly campaign. And here, as you uh, already have shown us, uh, Whitney, we have the 2022 campaign where we uh, state that lives can be saved and that access to healthcare is a basic human right. And I think this is really important to state this again and again, especially given the fact that many patients, most in the in the world are not diagnosed at all. So besides this, IPOPI had has its specific contribution to World PI Week. We support local implementation of uh, World PI Week through our grant program. And we support, for example, this year we will support uh, 28 national projects. Um, we also disseminate information about uh, the, the World PI Week material. We um, promote um, World PI Week through our, our uh, social medias, of course. And um, as a result, since the inception of the campaign, IPOPI supported 170 plus NMO, uh, which stands for National Member Organizations, National Campaign. I just would like to, to give you a, a flavor. Yes, among our activities, I would like to highlight um, the, the IPOPI campaign, which is called this year, My Physician and I, where we ask our members to just have the selfie with one physician, with their physician to highlight the importance of the link between a, a patient and a physician. And you can see here, maybe you can recognize him because with the mask it's not so easy. A patient with Alain Fischer uh, from France and uh, just having the selfie with his, um, his patient. So we, we hope that you Canadian people, you will have a lot of selfie to, to put on the social media that we would be able to share. And I hope that every country will do the same. And we already can see that on the social networks. Um, I, I just would like to give a flavor, a very quick one. Uh, of course, there is a lot to read, but uh, don't be afraid of that. I won't go into that. But just to see, uh, to show you what uh, the different kind of initiative that we can face and have throughout the world um, during this world um, PI week. And uh, for example, here we have China, but you can see that Hungary, for example, does a lot of very nice things as well. And we can see also that the initiative are very diverse. It goes to education, but also to events, to a lot of things, drawings, for example, contests, a lot of different things. Here is Kenya, where they just state about the fact that uh, rarely um, rare diseases is uh, something that we need to know about uh, because in many countries in the world, including maybe uh, Kenya, but not only, uh, having a rare disease is um, subject to stigma. And this is something that they want to address. Um, here we have Malaysia and they are also very active in the very different manners. 
Um, Poland, I wanted to have a word on Poland, where they provided last year masks to their community, and I think it was really appropriate given the very uh, tough period we have due to uh, COVID-19. Sudan, Sudan, which is a very poor country, and they have a lot of problem in diagnosis, and even more when they are diagnosed to access to care and to treatment, especially immunoglobulins. And uh, but they, they they have a group now, and they really do everything they can to raise awareness and to make the health authority uh, aware of their situation. I'd like also to address another poor country. It's not a poor country indeed. It, it's a country where people get poor because of their policies, their politicians. And, uh, but Venezuela is also very, very active. So the subject is access to care. And as uh, World PI Week uh, states, this is a basic human right. And when we speak about access, of course, we think of diagnosis. Access to diagnosis is a very primary thing that we have to, to consider. But when it goes to diagnosis, then we have to consider screening and especially new, uh, newborn screening data, collecting data, but also the knowledge uh, when it comes to laboratory knowledge and also facilities. In many countries, they just don't have facilities to make diagnosis. And of course, we also face medical awareness and knowledge. On another hand, we have, of, of course, access to treatment. This begins with diagnosis, but then we have to move to treatment. And this goes to access to treatment um, with a marketing authorization, because when a treatment exists, and we are pretty lucky in this field, uh, because many of our conditions have treatment, but is it marketed in a country? This is another question. When it is marketing, marketed, is it affordable? This is another question. Is it available? This is another question again. And we know about immunoglobulins, for example, that is not a question always of being a developed country and that we in many countries struggle to have a continuous supply with this condition. Of course, we need immunologists and not every country has some. Uh, we need facilities, and I'm thinking especially on for, for transplant, and not every country has. Uh, healthcare professional, in addition to immunologists, because this is not only about a physician, this is also about uh, nursing, or about um, a physiotherapist, or other kind of um, specialties, and also other organ specialists who need to be aware of PIDs, a lung specialist, for example, but many more. So this all figures out a healthcare environment. And I, at, at IPOPI, we have thought that maybe that would be interesting to uh, release some kind of tool that would describe it. So to allow our animals, our members, to advocate on this, being aware of uh, the situation in the country compared to other countries. Um, from all of this, of course, we have a strategic plan, but continuing on what I was uh, exactly saying about the, uh, the, the, the data that we could have and the environment in the country, we have worked on defining six uh, principles for care uh, for PADs, and uh, I'm speaking there of uh, golden standards, which we have translated into um, <clears throat> key principles. And here you can see, first of all, we have diagnosis, then treatment. We've introduced this one. This is universal, uh, universal coverage, because in many countries, this is not a given that you have access to the treatment, even if it is available in the country. For example, some country, you can access it when you are um, a, child, a, a child, but not when you get adult or you can access it uh, when you work for the army or if you are a civil servant or there are that kind of condition that makes that uh, not everybody can access to that. Of course, we need specialized centers where we have people skilled on PIDs. We need national patient organization who are very uh, skilled and we, we support them in that uh, for advocating, so to allow access together with the physicians. 
and we need data registries, we need epidemiology, and this is the six principles of care, which we have translated into criteria. If I just give the example of the PID diagnosis, we have the diagnosis rate in the country. This is pretty interesting to consider given a theoretical um, rate. A biological diagnosis, this is available, genetic, genetic prenatal, newborn screening. And then we have for every of those um, principles define that kind of criteria. And out of that, we have built uh, an index, which we call the PID Life Index, based on 100%. And is, it is aimed at measuring the status of the PID healthcare environment in a dedicated country. So with that, we have to gather uh, the data through a questionnaire, then have a database, and then we wanted to have this PID Life Index released out of a data visualization plus a map interface on the web so that everybody can be aware of the situation. And here you have a picture of the global environment for PIDs. You can see that Canada is pretty well because you are in the best quartile if I uh, may say so. And, but you can see that, first of all, we have a lot of gray parts, meaning that we have no data there. And of course, we have lighter blue, which means that the score is less important than in um, the best quarter. We have also translated that. Here you find the uh, six principles again. So this is the global score of Canada, for example, 67. On, on out of uh, 100 persons is really good. And you can see here, given the different principle where you have something that is less um, than expected, if I can say so. And this is something that we, we can, thanks to this uh, interface, enter into detail and go uh, deep digging uh, into detail. So access to care, what is IPOPI doing in addition to uh, just release what we know about the, the environment in every country, in fact, we work on several fronts. And if I, I, I even dare to say in more and more fronts. First, advocate, uh, advocating is very important and uh, advocacy, uh, this is something that is really um, a skill that uh, our patient group have more and more. And at IPOPI, we want them to have this because this is where the patient group can really uh, make the difference in their country. And, and yeah, as Adrian is there, I know that thanks to the advocacy of his uh, patient organization, for example, they have had access to subcutaneous in the country, which is a great achievement. Um, but this is just an example, but there are so many and so specific also a reason for advocating in each country. So we advocate at European level, especially because in Europe, this is important uh, to try to have directives uh, that will push, let's say, or support the different country to go into the best way possible for rare diseases. But we just not keep in uh, Europe. We also address, uh, for example, here with my colleague, Bruce Lim, uh, from Malaysia, board member of IPOPI, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, so to um, uh, raise awareness on the fact that we need to collect blood at first and plasma even better. Uh, and also the United Nations, we have some um, advocacy there. Um, we want to uh, always have the PIDs at the European agenda because also we know that the 26 countries in Europe uh, look at that, but not only there, as you well know, North America and Europe are kind of the place in the world where, where uh, the other country takes some, no, not model, but at least examples. So this is very important to work at this level. So we have uh, forums um, where we try to have uh, members of parliament, who will support our uh, theme, our topics, our asks. And, and there we um, just have the, the, the theme that is the most relevant from the policy, um, policy uh, actuality, let's say. So the next one we'll have is 
on antimicrobial resistance, multi-resistance, because, because many of our patients are on prophylaxis with antibiotics, for example, or on demand. And this is very important to push our countries and Europe especially uh, to uh, launch research on alternatives uh, for those um, antibiotics where we know that maybe they will less and less protect and we know that this will be a big burden in the coming years. And of course, we focus on plasma. More than 50% of our patients rely on IG therapy. And we know that the world is struggling uh, because of the, the to supply. Of course, we uh, struggle uh, because of the lack of uh, plasma collection. We know that for long. And of course, COVID-19 has highlighted this in a very strong way uh, because of the drop in collection. But this problem exists for long. And at the moment, we just try to um, make people understand, especially because at, in the European, um, at the European Commission, sorry, uh, the legislation on blood tissues and cell is under revision, and this is a momentum to let people, uh, the decision maker, hear from the patient voice. And this is not always easy because there are some other stakeholders who maybe won't say the same and maybe won't take uh, the patient interests at heart. And this is how it goes. So we have to really raise our uh, voice very strongly. Um, another topic where we want to address um, uh, is the, the newborn screening uh, activities. We, newborn screening for skids has proven being very efficient in many countries. I know that Canada is really good on that. I think that uh, you have almost all your provinces doing proceeding with this, which is great. And, um, but this is not the case uh, all over the world, uh, especially for example, in my own country in France, we just don't have this so far, which I can't understand to be honest, but this is the case. And uh, there we have um, a group under the brand Screen for Rare, where we are, uh, as IPOPI, we have the experts with us. Experts meaning uh, the International Screening, uh, Neonatal Screening Society, and of course the ACID as the, the for the physicians. And there we, we try to not push country to have this, but to push Europe to support their countries to launch that kind of problem by gathering experience, gathering data, well, support them so this is the most easy as possible because we don't believe that we should test for everything or screen for everything, but at least improve the way of screening, ensure that screening is not a one shot and that there is a solution after that. Because if you screen, if you find, but you are not able to treat, this is not the best way. So for that, we have created together as partner, the International Neonatal Screening Day and we will celebrate on June uh, 28th. Um, we also work in advancing clinical care. Uh, we, we know that in many countries, there is a lack of uh, immunologists. We need that young uh, doctors get interested in PIDs and moreover in immunology. And uh, we also want that uh, there are places where we don't just address research, but also the way research will go to the patient um, situation. And this is the role of EPIC, and this, is, this will be next week, so we are very busy at the moment. But we also have a lot of webinars, as you can see here, and we work uh, also with the forums and other things uh, like this. We more and more are committed in research. And I know that this is also the case for uh, some animals, for some members. And I would push you as a, a, a national member to also commit in research. This is the place for patients to partner in uh, research programs because there we can provide patient input in research and in the development process. We can also optimize patient involvement and also the communications. Um, and also, as I said, we can support with health policy and regulatory expertise. 
And um, for example, in, in Europe, we also are part of the European Research Network, RITA. RITA stands for all the immunological disorders far beyond um, PIDs. At the moment, uh, the following consortia have approached IPOPI to seek active collaboration. So you see, in many, in many fronts, we are asked to take part, and this is really very nice because this is important that there as well, and as early as possible, the voice of patient is heard and taken into account. Of course, we raise awareness and we do that through uh, mainly uh, meetings, meetings at national level, especially to launch, for example, new patient groups, as you can see uh, in different parts of the world, but also at regional level. We had one in uh, Southeast Asia. We will have at the end of this year, another one uh, in Southeast Asia. And, and there uh, we want to support our patients so they get skilled, uh, so they, can, uh, they are able to advocate. And also we provide them with a lot of material, like, like for example, those leaflets, you can see an example on the right hand side of the screen. <clears throat> now, and as a conclusion, I hope I am not too long. I, I just would like to, to, to speak about the evolving landscape. Um, we have to think also on the future and how, what the future will say about IPOP and about the PIDs and about the PIDs in every country. At the moment, when we began some years ago, from yeah, more than years, we, were, uh, we spoke about 130 uh, conditions. Now we are above uh, 460. Uh, where will we be in 10 years? And we can assume that maybe we will reach a thousand. We are not sure because it depends on the genes, but uh, uh, well, it's quite possible. We can see also more and more crossovers with autoimmunity, with autoinflammation, with allergy, with secondary immune deficiency, with cancer. And this is very important to work together to consider those things. Uh, we, of course, uh, need to improve in knowledge and diagnosis rates uh, for, with genetic screening, with newborn screening, and we still face a major underdiagnosis. Uh, under we estimate that 80% of the population worldwide is not diagnosed at the moment. Another thing that is a very uh, big challenge is access, and especially when it comes to pricing, especially with innovative uh, medicines, the, we can see, for example, with gene therapy, um, that the price are rising very high. And of course, uh, many uh, countries are afraid about reimbursing such amount of uh, money. So this is something that we will need to address and to um, prove the, the right balance between pricing and reimbursement and between uh, sick people and healthy people. Transition care between um, childhood and adult is also a, a, a big issue in many countries. Uh, advanced therapy um, being dis uh, are developed more and more, and uh, but uh, we still can't see any foreseeable alternative to immunoglobulins, and this is something that we need to state uh, because this is a big difference, for example, with our uh, friends from hemophilia. Um, the, the plasma uh, field is very uh, changing and very quickly. And at the moment, IgD demand said to continue driving the plasma field. And this is a, a, a very important issue and also a very important responsibility we have as uh, immunoglobulin users. Uh, we need for more regionally balanced plasma collection to attain global sufficiency. We don't want to speak about a national sufficiency when it comes to plasma and immunoglobulins because it doesn't make sense. But uh, we, we know that we, could, we, we can't keep on relying on the US. We need to expand newborn screening. And at the moment, I'm very happy to uh, say that we will have a first pilot in Malaysia, so far from Europe or from the United States or from Canada. And of course, we have to take lessons from COVID-19 because we are not sure that we won't have to face another uh, pandemic in some times. The way forward for IPOP is to uh, be committed to further increase the activities at the key international advocacy organization on behalf of the PID patient worldwide. 
And, um, and of course, we value very much collaboration with the stakeholders. And we need also to seize the many opportunities that present themselves to us and work together to overcome those challenges and to define our world forward. I know that Adrian will address this subject, but I would like also to say that Ukraine is in our hearts. Ipopi and his partner are working hard to support care, treatment and accommodation for refugees. And I want to highlight this just to say thank you to Canada, because I know thanks to the work of CEPO that you have made everything possible to be in the position to welcome refugees. And for that, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much for your um, attention and, um, and for inviting me once again. Thank you so much, Martine. Uh, Adrian, I'm going to pass it over to you now. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you also. I mean, I was happy to see the presentation of the Pope as this organization will have a special uh, place in my heart forever. And uh, what I would like to uh, address today to you is um, a little bit about the special circumstances that we are uh, here in Europe right now. Well, I just also remember that I met uh, your executive, I mean the executive of SIPO in the special circumstances because I met Whitney in Barcelona, one of the congresses, uh, and we uh, were met to be on a dinner, but we missed the bus, which was um, uh, organized to bring attendees on the dinner, and we were chasing this bus in a taxi. And I remember probably Whitney was trying to communicate with the taxi driver uh, in Spanish. So uh, this was a journey, and this is how I met uh, the representatives of SIPO. But those circumstances that we are uh, here and now are totally different. I wish to have more stories like this from Barcelona rather than to uh, deal with the situation that we have right now. So let me just uh, share my uh, screen, my presentation to show you what is the situation. So it's being shared. Let's start with, uh, start with the presentation. So. This presentation is about Ukraine, about the current situation in Ukraine. As uh, Whitney said, I, uh, I was the president of the Polish patient organization for nearly uh, 10 years, and I am patient myself, uh, a patient with X-linked agamoglobulinemia. And uh, I'm a lawyer. My profession, a lawyer specialized in medicine and reimbursement. And, uh, but I stepped down from being uh, the leader of the uh, Polish patient organization. And I started my own nonprofit in 2017, taking care of rare diseases, taking care of scientific and legal efforts regarding rare diseases, also in training other patient advocates from many various therapeutic fields, which are uh, in rare diseases. But as the uh, Russian invasions uh, started, as there is a problem with um, providing care to Ukrainian patients with PAD, I decided to be back in the business as long as would be needed. And uh, we are currently uh, helping those uh, people as a foundation. I mean, our nonprofit stopped the usual work and uh, focused on helping those uh, people. There is a first slide. You can see uh, a photo of Jehor. This is one of the first patients that we moved from Ukraine to Poland and provided him with immediate access to uh, immunoglobulins, as you can see on the uh, photo. When it comes about the situation, just let me explain that this is a humanitarian disaster that we're facing right now in Europe, that we're facing mostly in Poland, because most of the war refugees um, are in Poland because of many, many, many aspects. I mean, most important ones are the uh, close, uh, the fact that the Ukrainian is close to Polish, so it's easy to communicate, but also we had two million Ukrainians in Poland before the war. They were living and working here. Uh, so the patients uh, and the refugees would like to stay in Poland, even though they have a chance to move to um, Western parts of Europe. So generally speaking, there are uh, nearly 3 million of refugees in um, Poland. So from the statistics, it counts that they must be some uh, PAD patients and they are. And there are about 200 Ukrainians being hospitalized right now. Half of them are children. When it comes to Ukraine and the situation here, there are about 1,000 patients with PAD living uh, there, but only 200 of them are in the uh, have the replacement therapy. And there were some issues with uh, immunoglobulin access in Ukraine. I, also, I was also helping them 
uh, to solve it before the war. And of course, the war uh, changed everything. The hospitals are being bombed, were bombed. Uh, the supply chains were uh, stopped. Uh, so the patients with rare diseases, especially patients with PIDs, have to flee the war in order to get uh, the continuity of treatment in uh, in other country, preferably in Poland, as you can see. So we are doing everything we can to uh, aid them in the situation. I just have to say that uh, this is disaster which is going on in Ukraine. I mean, the brutality of this war, the uh, brutality of the aggression, uh, taking civilian targets, hospitals for a target is something I uh, still cannot believe it's being case. It's happening in the 21st century in Europe. Uh, but it is, this is the situation that we are being um, placed in, that we are facing, and we are doing everything we can as a team, but also as a nation, I believe, uh, to uh, aid those uh, refugees. When it comes to our uh, help, well, as I mentioned, we stopped our usual actions uh, for the time of the war, I decided to do it. And um, to just to focus ourselves using our contacts uh, in, with Ukrainians, with Polish physicians, with physicians in other EU countries, uh, to uh, start helping those patients who need it in Ukraine. What do we do? First thing first, we are helping them uh, flee the war. I mean, we are helping them to cross the border. We are helping them to cross the border with families, which is not obvious because men are not entitled to leave Ukraine. But if there is a need to do it, to have a carer, we are also doing everything we can on a legal basis to uh, provide them with safe transfer via the border, if needed with a humanitarian corridor. I mean, the corridor that we are being uh, organized with some kind of fast track for those patients. So we are moving them from Ukraine to Poland and then to specific uh, hospitals in Poland. I will elaborate more on it in a while. The second thing is to on site support uh, for the Ukraine is the state in uh, Ukraine, and the, fir the third one is providing information, legal support for those patients seeking care in uh, the European Union. When it comes to helping those patients flee the war, as I said, it's about helping them on every stage of their journey to Poland. I mean, uh, even uh, we got phone calls uh, from, let's say, Kharkiv, which is on the front line, like the, the woman was saying that I am, Currently on the bus, somebody placed me on the bus with children. We are going to Poland, what to do? And I have no idea when, when we will be in Poland and where we'll be in Poland. Please tell me what to do. We received calls from people like, we fled, fled the war. Uh, we are on the gas station in Warsaw. What should we do? And many other signals like this. And uh, we are, I mean, there are no procedures. We are just building the procedures and we are trying to scale the actions, but well, we haven't been prepared to such a situation, but we manage. I mean, we managed to help those people. Nobody that reached us uh, uh, was left without help. I mean, we helped everybody that um, asked us to do it. And so we also providing initial accommodation for the patient's family. Uh, we are taking care of the medical uh, affairs. I mean, to provide them with uh, the, all the needed paperwork in Poland and then to um, set up an immediate visit to the immunologist, which is of course crucial in order to provide them with immunoglobulins in uh, Poland. So we are doing everything to speed it up everything to um, match the dates of the uh, infusions that they got in Ukraine, that to the, there, will, there will be no delay in Poland regarding uh, providing them with uh, immunoglobulins in Poland. Of course, we are also doing everything to secure more uh, IGs to Poland. Uh, as Martin said, there is a global shortage, but uh, we are also doing everything we can to um, in cooperation with, uh, of course, industry and other stakeholders to provide as much immunoglobulin as possible to also secure the needs of Ukrainian patients, which are starting to be a significant part of the um, Polish PID patients community. Of course, we are also transferring them to other EU countries. It's often like there's somebody in Poland, but he decides or she decides to go further to other EU country or even outside the EU, like in the UK. So we are also contacting specific patient organizations or physicians to 
provide them with care there and uh, to do the paperwork in other EU uh, countries. As you can see on the photos, there is Yegor, uh, 11 years old, excellent patients which received uh, immunoglobulins in hospitals in, in, in Łódź, like two weeks after the family fled the uh, war. Uh, we managed to help over 50 families so far, probably would reach uh, 60 today, and number is still growing. There were a couple of waves of refugees. The biggest one was also in the beginning, but there was also a significant wave of refugees after relieving the war crimes that have been um, made by Russians in uh, Bucha near Kiev. Uh, what uh, is uh, important, we also secured not only treatment with immunoglobulins, but we secured uh, for um, bone marrow transplantations for patients with various types of immunodeficiencies uh, to skits, and also to liver transplantations for other patients with other rare diseases, namely Wilson disease. So this is also what we did to create a humanitarian corridor for them to ensure them with a fast track and to provide them with uh, the possibility of having a transplantation in Poland as the hospital where they were meant to have, it was of course bombed. So they have even dates of those bone marrow transplants, uh, liver transplants, but you know they just get the message that it's not possible. And so they need to do something. So we move them to Poland. And uh, there are various um, rare diseases, that, I mean, people with various rare diseases that we help, but as you can see on the list, most of them is with various uh, immune deficiencies. Mm, of course, there is X-link agammoglobulinemia, but uh, also uh, CVID and uh, OPS and the George and Nehmehan breakage syndrome. So this is not only about providing um, immunoglobulins, but also other kinds of care like wheelchairs and so on, special accommodation for them. So all of those people uh, require a very specialized approach. So I'm very happy that also I can uh, kudos my volunteers, a team of volunteers, uh, also volunteers uh, that came from the Immuno Project. But also other volunteers, med students that helped us, and my uh, wonderful team, which is also taking care of uh, those cases. When it comes to statistics, as you could see in one of those slides before, most of the uh, patients are children, and uh, most of them chooses to stay in Poland. I mean, those who reached us or were provided us, I mean, the physicians in Ukraine provided contacts to those patients. And uh, they mostly stay in Poland, but in some cases we move them to Germany, to Sweden, uh, to Austria, uh, and uh, to the UK, and to Czech Republic, and provided them with uh, care there. Uh, Germany has the most tough paperwork system regarding refugees, but maybe this is not a surprise. And uh, it's kind of easy to get a treatment in Poland, but uh, not in uh, Germany. Uh, but we're also doing our best to provide them with care there with cooperation with uh, a German patient organization. Uh, so we are helping them here legally, I mean, to obtain the refugee status, to get uh, some kind of internal numbers, uh, which, is, which are available in Poland to get, and then to provide them with uh, medical care. Uh, of course, with, with the primary care, but also the specialist, uh, I mean, to get them to the right immunologist. We are also translating the uh, medical records, which is very important these days. I mean, we got a team of engaged volunteers, medical translation, translators, which are translating them from uh, from Ukrainian to English. But this is enough. I mean, it's and it's, it's not possible to 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 get a translator from uh, Ukrainian to Polish right now, which is not a surprise. But uh, we are translating them to, into English, and this is okay. And this is also this helps much those patients too. Uh, at least to have some further diagnostics in Poland. What we also did is to deliver um, medicines and mostly medical equipment to hospitals in Ukraine that being treated, they are treating patients. Uh, please know that uh, the Western part of Ukraine now is very, um, they're in charge of treating most of the patients from the East, so the needs are huge. The medicines that were stored in the East, they are closed in the hospital or being damaged. So we need to deliver aid to those hospitals which are in the west of Ukraine to treat those internal displaced persons. I mean, the patients, 
which are the refugees, but internal refugees in Ukraine. They decided to stay in Ukraine, but in the Western part. So we also need to um, provide them with medicines. We raised over uh, 30,000 US dollars uh, to this purpose. And we, I mean, we bought we, equipment worth uh, over 20, 30,000 US dollars so far and uh, forwarded to Ukraine. Uh, there was one truck full of medicines, some kind of smaller, also um, donations that we are working to uh, to provide an infusion pumps, I mean, mechanical infusion pumps, which are not needing to have a power supply to all uh, Ukrainian PAD patients that need it. They are suitable for both IVIG and uh, subcutaneous IG as well. So this is what we do when it comes to medicines. It's not legal to provide uh, medicines to Ukraine according to the law in Poland and in the EU. But well, I cannot say more, but we are also, I mean, there are some medicines in Ukraine. And, and I have no idea how they uh, appeared to be in Ukraine. And when it comes to, of course, we are in touch with Ukrainian patient organizations. We got great um, relations before the war as they were attending our courses, online courses for patient advocates. So, of course, free of charge courses, online courses for patient advocates. So we are also giving them grants for their own projects. Uh, but you know, now, as we get great contacts, we are also in touch with them and provide uh, care to the, those patients and also provide some aid to the patients on site. When it comes to the on site support, they have been delivered to several hospitals treating PAD patients in Ukraine. And now, Kiev, I mean, the main hospital is Kiev, is somehow safer. So, we are also working on a delivery to them. But those, uh, as you can see, those hospitals are in the Western part in Ukraine. So they are treating the internal refugees and also we manage to deliver medicines to Poltava, which is currently on the front line. We also, uh, we also try to do our best to uh, ensure the access to immunoglobulins. Unfortunately, it's not possible to uh, transfer immunoglobulins for the border, but we are trying to do our best to buy them on site in Ukraine. Uh, from their national um, fractionator, which is maybe uh, which whose products are not available worldwide. This is only IDAG, but it is something during the war. So we are also working on that. When it comes to providing support and legal help, we developed two websites. The first one is about rare diseases. It's just rare diseases in Ukrainian written in a Latin script. And the second one is uh, immunodeficit um, So as you can see this is about immune deficiency and those in those websites contain legal information very extensive q a regarding how to access uh, treatment in poland where to find a uh, proper hospital when it comes to uh, pids and i know that there are patients who are uh, just taking information from the site and going directly to the hospitals uh, without our aid uh, so we are more than happy to have it we also uh, did a media campaign also in Ukrainian media in Poland to promote it. Uh, so uh, we are very proud that we have those uh, those websites with legal opinions, with contact information, with uh, some kind of information regarding how to obtain medical care in Poland. If everything, of course, is in Ukrainian, so it's easy to understand for those who are in need. As I said, there are uh, websites uh, and um, we also provided some legal opinions. Obviously, we are lawyers. I mean, I and our main project manager is also a lawyer. Uh, so we created the legal opinions. We got it translated. We got the opinion also of the Ukrainian lawyer who is a refugee in Katowice in our town. And so we are helping regarding legal issues. And in the beginning of the war, it was like that. It was not sure if those patients are entitled to get immunoglobulins well, but we are sure that they are. So we also did some advocacy work directly in the hospitals to provide them with uh, care. If there was a problem, well, we are patient advocates. So uh, we were strict and we did our best to provide them with the care. Now it's not a problem. Also, we are currently working on two leaflets. First one about the medical system in Poland uh, from perspective of the rare disease patient, I mean, how to get a, uh, to the right specialist. And also a dictionary, uh, I mean, the two-size dictionary for patients with PIDs di directly. 
uh, with 100 uh, most important medical terms, but also with pronunciation, both in Polish and Ukrainian. So both sides can use this leaflet as a help in communication regarding their disease. We also cooperate with other entities. There is a photo from a uh, meeting that to, to, took place the day before yesterday in Warsaw, Eurodis. I mean, we are very glad that we can cooperate with Eurodis. On those matters, uh, we've also we got a meeting with a member of the European Parliament. Uh, we uh, have contacts with the uh, European uh, Medicines Agency regarding shortages of IGs. So we're doing our best to create a working environment for those who are in Poland. I mean, both to secure funding to the Polish healthcare system from the other European partners, but also to uh, secure uh, the continuity of treatment for patients from Ukraine. Uh, as I said, there is a meeting uh, last, uh, I mean, the day before yesterday, the flag came from Kiev, from the direct uh, war zone to Poland with refugees, uh, with Tatiana Zamorska, who is the head of the uh, Ukrainian Rare Disease Organization. And uh, we had a meeting uh, with Eurodis, with Red Cross, um, regarding the situation in Ukraine. So we are cooperating with partners. I'm also glad to uh, see our remarks in the letter that have been addressed to Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the European Commission. So we are doing our best also on the uh, higher level, I mean, not on the ground level, but, all, but also on the level uh, of uh, politics, of uh, direct advocacy work. Well, the best how to depict the situation is a human story, and uh, let's meet Emily. Emily is a patient with severe combined immune deficiency, and she has the donor and the date of bone marrow transplant in Kiev. It was like couple of days after the war started. So they bombed the hospital and they learned that there would be no bomb marrow transport in, in, in Ukraine. So they decided to flee Poland. They contacted us, of course, via the patient organization. And we provided them with, with everything. Uh, it was the third day after the evasion. So there were totally no procedures. And we managed to have a mm, free space for um, bone marrow transplant in less than 24 hours before they called us in the hospital in Bydgoszcz in the central Poland. So we are proud of it, but we are very happy to see Emily and that she's doing well in Poland right now. She's waiting for the date of the uh, BMT. And the, of course, the BM, date of the BMT is uh, already being said. There is a donor and we keep our finger crossed uh, for Emily and her family also happy that her family settled in Poland. I mean, the, her father find a job in Poland in his profession, he's a carpenter. Uh, they uh, are well provided with everything they need in, uh, in the place that they are. And we are, we keep our finger crossed for uh, the successful BMT and that Emily will be cured from the severe combined immune deficiency shortly. Uh, of course, uh, there were some media appearances, both in the um, European media, US-based media, like National Journal, and also in Polish media. We also received many thanks for the patients, which is a real fuel for us for further actions. Uh, of course, our, free is free, our help is free of charge, completely free of charge, and this is what I would like to underline. We are doing it as volunteers right now. We are just uh, counting on, on other people's generosity to uh, make the foundation work, uh, but our help is free of charge of the patients. No matter if it's a legal help, help with accommodation, shelter, everything is free of charge. They're, they are in need. They have bombs uh, in their country. They have war crimes in their country. So we have to help them as patient advocates, and I believe also as uh, human beings. We also receive help from the patients that we uh, help, I mean, from the hospitals that we helped we provide them with humanitarian aid uh, so we are very uh, happy to see that the medical equipment is working uh, for those patients in need and uh, those people are the real heroes i mean uh, what there is a common ukrainian saying that uh, they are saying that slava ukraini slava heroim slava it means glory to ukraine glory to heroes and when it comes to heroes, I believe that heroes are the Ukrainian uh, physicians who stayed in the country and they are currently treating patients that they needed um, desperately. So they are, those, are, those people are the real heroes of the war for us. Uh, also received many, many various thanks also from the hospitals. Uh, it's, I mean, 
we um, got it today and we were really moved in the office when we read it. And this is the fuel for us as well. We cooperate with uh, a couple of donors right now. I'm happy that the industry also saw the uh, necessity of, of um, helping us. I would like to say kudos to CSO Bering for providing us grant for, of course, directly just for medical equipment, but in the first days of the war, and this really helped us to start delivering medical equipment to, uh, to uh, Ukraine. Of course, we cooperate with other uh, organization, not profit ones, like Eurodis, like the Ukrainian patient organization, but also, of course, we are in touch with uh, my, let's say, my colleagues from the PES organization, I mean, from in the product, as we are friends, of course, uh, without any issues. So we are also in touch with them, and we are helping uh, as much as we can, and we will do it as long as it will be needed. I mean, I'll be more than happy to, back, uh, to be back in the business as usual after the white stops, but now our help is desperately needed and we know it and we are doing everything we can to support those people. When it comes to us, I mean, it was described uh, described before. I would like to say also thanks to my wife, uh, Bernadetta, uh, which is a vice president, vice president of the foundation uh, and also CEO founder. And we are uh, as a whole, as a team, doing our best to provide those uh, patients with care. Of course, I, uh, I would like to ask you for any kind of support you might provide uh, for the patients here. We are working on the donation page, uh, probably will be ready next week, uh, but uh, it won't be possible without the great chain of goodwill. I mean, it's, it's impossible how, it, uh, how it's so possible. I'm sorry for this wording, but uh, I can believe how many people are involved in such actions, how many volunteers are involved in some actions from various countries all over the world. You've got medical translators in the NY, in Washington, we got medical translators in the UK. We've got volunteers from, from various countries. Uh, I mean, this is something real big. Yesterday, uh, I got a meeting with uh, people from Singapore that were um, trying to help us. So this is really something that we feel the support of the world, we feel support of Canadian organization as well. I'm very grateful for the invitation that I can share. What is the situation currently here? Uh, so we are very grateful. I can say that the patients are also really, really grateful. And when they say thank you to us, be aware that also they are thanking you uh, for all the support that they got, uh, even in words, but also in some kind of financial measures or any other kind of donations to them. And uh, well, I will be in service as long as will be needed, will be in service as long as will be needed. So I am really happy that I could share this with you and I keep my fingers crossed for peace because this is the final solution of this uh, whole uh, whole mess. So thank you for, um, for being with me. Thank you for attention. And I'm ready to uh, answer those um, any questions that would be, uh, that would come from you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Adrian. I am uh, going to stop sharing my screen. You're Thank you here. so much. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions today. <laughs> uh, we had such wonderful presentations from our speakers. Um, if anyone has any questions for our speakers, please email us at info at cpo.ca. And we will pass them over to Adrian and Martine and get those answered. I have some questions that I'm going to send them and get answered. And we will post them up uh, on our website along with the video of this uh, uh, webinar. And that will be posted up on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, I would also like to say that this week for World PI Week, April 22nd to 29th, any donations that we receive here at CIPO, we are donating 50% of all of our donations this week um, to go to the efforts of organizations like Adrian's, as well as two other organizations working um, to ensure access for Ukrainian patients um, for PI. So you can see more details of that on our website, um, including which organizations those are. Uh, we appreciate everything that Adrian's organization is doing, um, as well as iPoppy. We've been working, Martine kind of said a little bit about what we're doing. We've been working with uh, Dr. Bruce Ritchie's clinic 
in Edmonton, Alberta, to try and make it easier in case uh, we any patients need to come to Canada from the Ukraine, we have a process in place and it's done and ready. So I'd like to thank Martine as well for helping us to get that process in place. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. As I said, this would be available on our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully by the end of the day. Um, and we will be sending out that link and it will be also on our website. So thanks again to Adrian and to Martine and everyone for joining us. Don't forget we have our walk for PI tomorrow and Sunday. So hopefully everyone will get up and walk with us and we'll see you soon. Happy World PI Week, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you and good walk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.